conjure an image of the Russian tundra, Siberia, as far north as you can go before you hit the Arctic Ocean. Your image probably looks like a snowy whiteout. You might picture stark, forbidding ice scapes, devoid of color and life. But through the lens of National Geographic explorer and photographer Evgeny Arbogaiva, it's a wonderland, bristling with people and their stories, like, for example, the keepers of the remote weather stations that line Russia's Arctic coast. When I was a kid, my dad would bring me to visit a meteorological station, and I wanted to be in all of them. I just wanted to see how, how it is to live there. So, as an adult, she hopped on an icebreaker that brought supplies to those isolated outposts. I saw this uh, station that was, you know, from the 30s that haven't been renovated since then and was all surrounded by sand. And then there's this uh, man comes out with his bright blue eyes, total loner, unable to kind of make connections with people because he's just too overwhelmed by all of us. The man's name was Slava. He was in his 60s, and he lived alone at the weather station, an hour's helicopter ride from the nearest settlement. Right away, Evgeny was drawn to him. He was kind of trying to hide almost from everyone, but I could tell that he is, he is a real thing. He is of the Arctic, of the nature. Mm-hmm. So how did you, I mean, if he's afraid of people or, you know, not good at making connections, how did you convince him to let you come and spend time with him? Well, as they're unloading all the supplies and all these people from meteorological organization, they're like, okay, Slava, you know, give us the charts, blah, 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 all these things. And he's overwhelmed by all these questions. And I, I'm there and I'm like, oh, what's this? And well, what's this in the distance? He's like, oh, let's go, I'll show you. So he took me just, I think he was happy that to get away from um, all these people. Evgenia followed Slava for a photo series called Weatherman. She captured the storm-battered wooden cottage where he lives, his lonely march to log data in sub-freezing weather, and the antique-looking radio that's one of his few links to the outside world. I learned so much from him. Um, What I saw in him is this total honesty about who he is and acceptance of who he is. And also understanding the value of the land um, in a sense that he found the spot that makes him happy. And he, he is this land. So he managed to get into the point where he is this sea and he is this peninsula as much as he is Slava. I'm Peter Gwynn, editor-at-large at National Geographic, and this is Overheard, a show where we eavesdrop on the wild conversations we have here at Nat Geo and follow them to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. This week, why it's impossible for Evgenia Arbogaiva to look away from the Arctic. She tells us about hunters looking for the tusks of ancient mammoths melting from the permafrost and about nomadic reindeer herders following the rhythms of their ancestors and why this unique environment leaves humans both awed and afraid. More after the break. Evgenia's story starts on the edge of Siberia in a town called Tixi. It's a small town on the shore of Laptev Sea in the Russian Arctic in the Republic of Yakutia. And um, when I was growing up there, it was about 12,000 people living there, so it was pretty big. It was a famous and important seaport on the Northern Sea Route. And during Soviet time, there were all these people coming, uh, working there, military people, scientists, seamen, and it was quite a vibrant community. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so I grew up there. My parents were teachers in, in the high school. And then after the fall of Soviet Union, everybody just kind of, it was this massive wave of migration. And we moved to the city called Yakutsk, and, which is the capital of Yakutia. And officially the coldest city inhabited by people. <laughs> um, the coldest city yes, inhabited by people. Yes. Right now, I just talked to my dad um, just now this morning. He said it's minus 55. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> Celsius. But Tixi, was it as cold as that? Yeah, it's not as cold as Yakutsk. It's a harsher climate because of the uh, the winds. The winds are really strong and blizzards sometimes last for a few days and you just, you literally cannot even go out uh, from your house. As a kid, it was great because you don't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> you have sn- even snow days in the Arctic. Yeah, the blizzard days, we call it, because you're, you, you just, you know, if, you, if you're, especially if you're a small kid, you come out of the house and you literally will be just flying in the tundra uh, because it, the winds are so strong. So tell me how you came to photography then, from Tixi to Yakutsk. You know, I know from working with photographers, the cold is not the friend of the camera. <laughs> so yeah. how did, how, when did that start? When I was 15, I was an exchange student in, in Connecticut, in the U.S., and I took photography class, and I was just blown away right away. And, <laughs> you know, I spent a lot of time in the dark room. And, and then when I came back to Yakutsk, I thought, okay, I have to um, continue. So I started uh, working in the local newspapers and developing my film because there's not much places to develop a uh, film, and I, I was developing f- uh, my film in, in the dark room in the morgue. Um, the- <laughs> <laughs> morgue? Is that where you keep dead, dead bodies? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. So you're developing your pictures in like a, in the morgue of like the city morgue? Of a hospital, yes. Oh, of a hospital. Yeah, because I, uh, there was, you know, there was not, no places to develop film, and there is, there was this guy who was taking pictures of, of uh, dead people and corpses in the hospital, and he had this dark room, and so I was going there and was developing my film. <laughs> oh my, was that weird? I mean, was it, was it creepy? Um. I mean, is no, there like a cadaver over here? I was very much here? focused on, on, on developing my film. <laughs> I was gonna say, right, right. So how did you take it to the next level? What ha- what comes next? Uh, then I I went to study in Moscow in this Moscow International University. I was studying management, art management, and then I went to travel with reindeer herders, and I was working um, as a you know I was living in the, with the reindeer herders Wait and a working. How, so how do you make that connection? You went from art management to reindeer herding. That was like a, that was a big leap there. In Yakutsk, I mean, it's, you know, we're so close to um, indigenous cultures. Most of them are nomads and reindeer herders. So I was aware of them and I was photographing them at um, the celebrations that are happening in Yakutsk. And also um, a family of reindeer herders, a good family friend of, of ours. So when I came back after university in Moscow, I just joined our friend and I started migrating with them. And What does that look like? What do you mean, the migrating? It's a, um, well, reindeer herders, they have a herd for, of about 2,000 reindeer, and some of them live in the tomb, some of them live in the tents, and they follow the, the herd. So they migrate every, depending on the season, um, they migrate every week or, or, or less, depending on if it's winter or summer. Let's kind of skip ahead a little bit to going back to Tixi. How did that come about? So after living with reindeer herders, I, at some point I did start photographing because um, it was just so amazing, some things that I saw there. And at that point I'm thinking, okay, this is what I want to do. And I want to be a photographer. And I go to New York to study photography in International Center of Photography, a uh, one-year program. And then I stay in New York for a little bit, and I'm being completely overwhelmed by everything that is happening in New York. There's mm-hmm. amazing art, amazing artists around, the 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 speed of the city. I love it, uh, and I hate it at the same time as all New York, as, as all people who live in New York. And then I think, okay, I have to go back to Tixi. I remember th- that longing that I had all those years, and I thought to go and explore it as a photographer. This is how many years later? You're how, how old? Nineteen now? years later. Okay, is this the first time you've been back? Yeah, it's first time I'm back since we left. What did that feel like? It felt so strange. It, it yeah, I had very strong emotions, uh, especially because now, as I mentioned before, when I lived there, there was twelve thousand people living in town, and now it's only four thousand. So the most of majority of buildings in town are abandoned. So 
it looks very scary and just, I was just really, really sad. I thought that I'm not going to take any pictures because it's just too too sad to, to photograph. That's so um, ironic because the pictures that I've seen that you took of Tixie are not sad. Well, my first trip, after wandering these empty streets, um, I went to the shore of the sea and I was sitting there just kind of looking at um, the horizon. And I saw a family um, by the bonfire. And there was this girl who was just um, throwing stones in the water and they were very quiet. And I could feel that they were in the same emotional wavelength somehow. And we started talking, and the more we started talking, the more I thought, this girl, she's still here. She still has her reality here in Tixi. How does she seize the town? And next trips, I came back, and I already, you know, was following Tanya, this girl. (laughs) And she opened her vision of town to me, which was so similar to how I remember it. So I thought, wow, so it doesn't really matter. You know, if you love a place and if you're a kid, you don't see that that all this, you know, ruins, ruins start to be a playground. It becomes a haunted house full of stories to explore rather than a relic or a reminder of um, fallen empire. What was it like to go to these places with her and you and you're seeing it through her eyes, but you're also seeing it in your memory. Because my childhood in 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 Tixi ended so abruptly, so that it wasn't like, you know, I was growing out of it. It was just like I had this beautiful world, and then I was taking away from it, and and so there was no closure. And I was just so happy to be with Tanya, and to become a kid again um, in this place, and have enough time to play again in the tundra and to run again, trying to touch Aurora or things like this. And Trying to touch Aurora. <laughs> yeah. Is that a game that kids play in the Arctic? Or, I want to play that game. <laughs> yeah. Or like making wishes, um, you, you know, or like um, digging a hole in the tundra and putting your wishes and writing your wishes and putting your wishes in there, hoping that they will all come true and things like this, you know. And, and because it was just me and her and her friends, and no adults um, around. I just was so free to be a kid again as well. What does the aurora borealis look like in Tixi? It is a part part of daily life. I mean, when I was a kid and when Tanya um, was in Tixi, you just see aurora on your way to school because in, in winter it's polar night, so you don't see the sun at all for a few months. So you go to school and then you just watch aurora. What is it? What does it look like? And it, it can be different. Uh, it can be just green or just white or just yellow, or it can be uh, all kinds of colors, purple, yellow, green. Uh, it depends. It can be very different. It can be a little bit. It can completely explode in the sky. Um, and it's moving. It's like shimmering and moving across yeah. you? Or? Yeah, it's moving. It's, it's, it's like this. Uh, it's alive. <laughs> Why is it important to you to focus on the Arctic right now? I mean, I know you you come from the Arctic and you have obviously have a deep love for it, but what are you thinking about right now about, you know, the situation that the Arctic faces? Oh, there's so many things going on um, around the world, but uh, in the Arctic especially. I mean, I can not take pictures there now, you know, it's just... There's just so many changes and so many things that I, 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 I know they need to be photographed now. Like, w- we used to look at it with awe, right? Now we're looking at it and we're scared. Are you scared? I'm both in awe and scared. So one story that you work, I think it may have been your first story for National Geographic, was looking at um, the uh, mammoth Tuss. And I think... In a way, that story speaks to the changes in the Arctic. That, that was such an interesting sort of 
way to look at how the climate's changing. Yeah, that was um, a very interesting um, assignment and my first one. The story takes place in this uh, um, uninhabited island in the in the Laptive Sea. And because of the erosion and permafrost thaw, there is this mammoth tusks that are uh, emerge from the land. So these are woolly mammoths that were living in this region and then like they're frozen there or are they how are the mammoths there i guess is my question well the mammoths used to live there and then um their carcasses and and their bones are preserved so well because of permafrost and because now permafrost is sowing all these remains of mammoth come out mm-hmm. and 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 what happens now is it becomes they call it like this tusk rush. So there is all this people like a gold rush, like a gold rush, but <laughs> tusk rush. Yeah, because after the ban of uh, international trade of uh, elephant ivory, Chinese market needed to have a um, replacement for the material. So mammoth now with emergence of all these mammoth tusks in Siberia, this was a, this is now a material the carvers are working with. Mm-hmm. And it's not illegal to use mammoth tusks. It's not, okay. yeah. Uh, but there's, it's a gray kind of area still. And, you know, sometimes uh, we were, when we we're digging out the skull of a mammoth and you're just, I was just standing there thinking, wow, this is so scary. What's going to happen? Because we were also, when, when I was on the Bolshoi Lyachovsky and I had a GPS and we had an older map, so it, that was 2013, and I had a map of 2008 on my GPS. And I was standing on the edge of the island, and the map of 2008 was showing that I'm very much inland. And that's when I was just struck by the difference of the border of the edge of the island. Because it had, because it, the permafrost eroded. had eroded. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And some of the islands, um, scientists predict even in my, li- in my lifetime, they won't, won't be there anymore. The island will be gone. Yeah. So what, what's next? What do, you, what do you want to do next? I keep working. I just finished uh, three new stories um, in the Arctic. And these are, in a way, the like Weatherman was the first chapter mm-hmm. of the stories. And now I, I produced three more chapters. And I'll, ju- I'll be just keep creating my necklace with different beads and each story as a as a bead um yeah I'm, i keep working in the arctic is there any particular image that you just can't get out of your head that you're would, it would be your dream to photograph well right now i'm really i really want to be able to find a way to photograph tundra in the in the way that people could really see it because, you know, tundra is just a, as, as, you know, in some areas they call it uh, Arctic desert, right? So it's just a very empty space, but it's not. And it's the a world of its own. And, and so I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm trying to figure out now how do I capture that tundra as space. Mm-hmm. It was a backdrop almost mm-hmm. visually always for a story unfolding. And now I really want to focus on like this natural spaces that are protagonists of their own. Wow. Well, Evgeny Arbogaiva, thank you very much. Thank you so much. To see more of Evgenia's work, her photos from Tixi and her National Geographic stories about mammoth ivory hunters and chasing rare butterflies in Malaysia, check out the links in our show notes. You can also find her photographs on our Instagram feed, at Nat Geo. And Evgeny is working on a new documentary set in a region of Siberia that features some of the world's biggest gatherings of walruses. You can find links for all of that in the show notes. They're right there in your podcast app. If you like what you hear and you want to support more content like this, please rate and review us on your podcast app. And consider a National Geographic subscription. That's the best way to support Overheard and hear more great stories. Go to natgeo.com forward slash explore to subscribe. Overheard at National Geographic is produced by Brian Gutierrez, Jacob Pinter, Marcy Thompson, and Alana Strauss. Our senior editor is Eli Chen. Robert Molesky edited this episode. Our senior producer is Carla Wills. Our executive producer of audio is Devar Ardalan, who produced this episode. 
Our fact checkers are Robin Palmer and Julie Beer. Michelle Harris fact checked this episode. Our copy editor is Amy Kolzak. Hansdale Seuss sound designed this episode and composed our theme music. This podcast is a production of National Geographic Partners. The National Geographic Society is committed to illuminating and protecting the wonder of our world and funds the work of National Geographic explorer Evgeny Arbogaeva. Whitney Johnson is the Director of Visuals and Immersive Experiences. And I'm your host, Peter Gwynn. Thanks for listening, and see you all next time.